welcome to season two of the Culinary Saijiki podcast. This season, I'm going back to Haiku's roots, pun intended, and focusing on how agriculture and food show up in the work of the classical poets. For more food and haiku goodness, you can read the blog at culinarysaijiki.com. And if you would like to be a guest this season, go to the blog and fill out the contact form. You can support the project by going to buymeacoffee.com slash culinary or simply share this show with whoever you think would enjoy it. All right, let's get started with today's topic. Welcome to part two of my interview with Patricia McGuire from Poetry P. In this portion of the conversation, we analyze even more Busan translations and have a great time doing so. And we do our best to provide some cohesive concluding thoughts. I do also want to plug over at Poetry P a two-part episode with Janice Doppler on the concept of Zoka. It was a a great little series and you really need to listen to part one um, to get to part two so don't skip part one Uh, but there's something Janice said in part two that explains sort of the creative force of the seasons that was a real eye-opener for me you'll hear me say in my conversation with Patricia how much I you know I keep over and over again wrestling with how to conceptualize um, different approaches to the seasons. And Janice Doppler's Zoka-related explanation was sort of an epiphany for me. So I really encourage you to check that out. Over at my Buy Me A Coffee page, uh, yesterday, yes, yesterday, uh, well, on Sunday, I'm recording this on Monday. It will post Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. But uh, as at the time I am recording this, Yesterday, I posted a bonus recipe for supporters for Café de Oya, which is a Mexican coffee that is near and dear to my heart. And if you are a supporter and you, you're wondering why you didn't get an email about that, well, I forgot to hit the little checkbox to email all of you. And once it gets posted, you can't go save and then easily send it. But uh, anyway, it's there. It's delicious. And if you are a supporter, go check it out. Uh, In other news, my chat book, Postcards from Texas, is officially out. You can buy it direct from Cuttlefish Books or contact me directly because I have 60 fresh copies sitting on my filing cabinet and they are beautiful. I am so happy with them. I will provide more information about how to do that in the show notes. Uh, There's no new blog post last week it was a really just intellectually taxing week at work and uh, i just decided to cut myself some slack and not try to write anything profound so i didn't but i figured you know with this uh, incredibly rich series of conversations with patricia that is good enough all right one last thing you've already heard me start to tease season three Uh, That will, I've alluded to it elsewhere, season three, the theme is feasts and festivals. It will be the final season for this project. I'm getting to a point where things are just getting really cohesive. And I feel like I'm with season three, I'll have said what I need to say. Uh, With that in mind, I have some big ambitions and I can't do it all myself because I cannot be an expert in everything myself. So start thinking about whether you would like to write blog pieces or do podcasts about specific uh, ethnic, national, cultural, religious, spiritual, food-related traditions. Uh, And uh, there will be more information about that within the next week or so. I am already starting to think about it because, again, big plans. All right, with that, let's get back to my fantastic discussion with Patricia. 
I'm going to start with a trans, uh, traditional translation of 575, so I'm going to be really interested what you have to say about these ones when we get to talking about them. So, from beneath its leaves, in your search for a pillow, pick out a melon. And that's translated by John Wyke and Tara Sato. Hidden among the leaves of the melon patch, find yourself a pillow. Translated by Edward McFadden. Finding a pillow hidden in the leaves, a melon in a field. Alan Persinger. Now, Alison, on your website, you've given the definitions of melon, melon as a summer kigo for the most part, although you have referenced the fact that um, in your old neck of the woods, you would find uh, melons appearing in autumn. I think is, is that a Texas thing? It's probably because you were getting quite far south, I guess. Far south, later growing season, like just a lot of, um, a lot of produce in general would be fresher and more available longer mm. in the Midwest. This is something that has been very hard to deal with. <laughs> oh, have you moved further north? Is is where you are now? St. Louis is farther north. It's farther east. Um, and like, and also like produce in Texas was so much. I mean, because you're so much closer to these to the points of distribution so um, it was cheaper and like us oh. <laughs> oh sorry about that <laughs> you want to try it's, and come and li live here then you can tell me about it i could not i would i would be so sad i would just be so sad <laughs> um there has been you know a good learning experience in a place with more actual seasons rather than just like summer for a long time um mm -hmm. to really like relearn what foods are available when and like the fluctuations of things um and so like it doesn't it's still warm it doesn't feel like sweet potato weather yet but i go to the farmer's market and sweet potato like there's not a lot of them but they're, them coming in and they're good mm -hmm. um and so it's 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 interesting to just see that and see like the way things like overlap and how they don't like the seasons never parcel out neatly yeah i mean i think you touched slightly on that in the same um in the same blog that you were writing, because you say mm -hmm. that uh, classic, well, I'll get to the point that I'm making, but the cl classical poets and poems connect us to our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, you know, uh, my ancestors were Irish farmers. And at the time Busson was writing, they'd probably be starving, God love them, what with the potato famine and, and all that. And melon would have been the thing of fairy tales. I, I, I just, it would have blown their minds. Um, which took me to wondering about melons um, and Japan and the 18th century. So what did I learn of this melon in Japan? Well, first off, it's likely that Busan is talking about an oriental melon, which I don't think I've ever seen. But if you Google it, if you Google Busan and an oriental melon, you're going to find a drawing that he did of an oriental melon monster, which is quite funny. And the other thing I found out that these the seeds of this particular melon have been found in Japanese archaeological sites dating way back to 14,000 BC. I'm sorry, I'm old school, so I'm still doing BC and, and AD. But And that you can eat every bit of this melon from its flesh to the outer rind, which again blew my mind because I'm used to the sort of uh, cantaloupe or, or charante or honeydew. And really, I cannot imagine... Well, you know yourself, when you try eating the rind of a honeydew melon, it's disgusting. That was gross. It is, absolutely. And so I started wondering, what do you use the oriental melon for apart from a pillow? And apparently in Busson's day, it was terribly popular. The fruit was really common. And I imagine that made it really cheap. And that would make sense because Busson was not a rich man. He was constantly whinging about how poor he was. So if the melon were common and relatively cheap, that would explain why Busson wouldn't be afraid to pick one and use it as a melon and ruin it, essentially. And again, melons in my youth were the sort of fruit that were brought, brought as a treat, almost as a status symbol to uh, those of us who grew up in households not imbued with vast amounts of money in Europe. Or, so I could just hear my mum and her sisters sort of looking at this melon it would have been a honeydew looking at this melon and cutting it open and tasting it and just you know just being so amazed that essentially it wasn't a potato um so what about you Alison does was the melon commonplace in your life was it you know 
was it something to be treasured as it was in my early days it was more like a, just a, a thing you ate in the summer um okay. and you know based on you know in the united states like watermelon is quite common and quite okay. available uh mm -hmm. so we would we would get tons of watermelon in the summer um and you know we still a lot of times like john and i still do but we make um agua fresca which is just, you know it's like a mexican type of fruit juice uh that melon mm. works very well for because you can't really juice a melon but you can sort of puree it and make a nice sort of slushy mm -hmm. like hearty beverage um so watermelon was common cantaloupe we also got in the summer um I never liked honey. Like we would get honeydew very occasionally. I feel like honeydew was just one of those things that would like end up in a restaurant like fruit cup as a oh, filler. Okay. And mm -hmm. it would always be kind of hard and not good. So I can't say I even <laughs> like a honeydew melon. Like I don't think I've ever had a good properly ripe, properly grown honeydew melon. Oh. Um, <laughs> but okay, you should have yeah, you should have tried that in that London. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, you should have tried that in London. You might have had better luck, maybe. But yeah, uh, so it's not it's know. not your favorite. But I'm intrigued now. You said, um, how do you make this? What did you call it? An aqua fresca? Agua fresca. Uh, the simplest way. I'm not sure. It's a agua fresca. It's it's Mexican. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I'm not sure of the fanciest way. But you know what? What? Well, and usually John will do this because he's more patient. But he'll <laughs> blend it up, and you know, a, a watermelon. He get the seeds out. Watermelon is pretty fibrous, so he'll strain it two or three times to get the most solid parts oh. out, mix it with a little uh, water uh, just to thin it and uh, some lime juice and a little bit of like extra sh sugar just to boost it a little bit. It's very refreshing in the summer. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Oh, I shall, um, I shall have a go at that then. I do like it, something interesting just to, to drink. Um, anyway, let's hear those poems again. And we can have just a quick chat about the uh, translations. From beneath its leaves, in your search for a pillow, pick out a melon. John White and Tiara Saito, Sato. Hidden among the leaves of the melon patch, find yourself a pillow. Edward McFadden. Finding a pillow hidden in the leaves, a melon in a field. Alan Persinger. And this last version of the poem uh, was the was the first of, of today's translations by Persinger. And he had something interesting to say about translating style. And I thought I'd share it with you before I come back and test you again, Alison, and see which one you like. So he chose to present his translations in free verse, he says. In his translations, he concentrates on the content, the images, and the individual words, since he holds it important that not only are the translations accurate, but they fulfill aesthetic expectations. Furthermore, he says, while it's impossible to separate form and content, my translations privilege content over form, since I believe it would be nearly impossible to keep the syllable count of 575 and not do drastic damage to the meaning. And I think I, I sort of agree with him. And as I said, so you have his finding a pillow hidden in the leaves, a man in a field, just freely translated. And then you have John White and Tara Sato's From Beneath Its Leaves in Your Search for a Pillow, Pick Out a Melon, which is the traditional version. And again, we're not going to criticize because we can't, you know, we, we're not putting ourselves forward to do these things. But how do you feel about those two variations of the translations there? There's in the, the, in the John White and the Edward McFadden, there's something interesting slash odd going on with the grammar there mm, there's yeah. sort of a little I, it's not I don't think it's a true passive construction and by the way everyone's like Allison's gonna judge me for my grammar because she's an English professor and I'm like I'm not <laughs> I don't care I have better things to deal with but when we're like analyzing things I think it's worth you know noting that there's something interesting like it's not a true passive construction I don't think but it's mm -hmm. from beneath its leaves pick out a melon like there's something about the it and then the your so it's mm -hmm. going like the it and the it's it's something about just like the grammar of that that just it feels like a little disjunctive um yeah, yeah. Um, do you and, think do you think because that one's the one that's gone for the traditional form do you think they put it in that way because that was the only way that they could get it to work maybe yes 
I mean, yeah. I, I would, again, I can't know for sure, but I would, sure. you know, whenever I see any sort of haiku that feels like especially clunky or something feels off with the grammar um, or the syntax, I go and count the syllables and it's almost always five, seven, five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I always think it's a bad sign when you have to count, well, you, know, you don't have to count the syllables, but when you, when you think something's off about that, I'm going to count the syllables. Yeah. It strikes me that, I mean, it's just highlighting the, the oddness of it, the clunkiness yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. sorry, you were going to say something about the McFadden one. The, the McFadden one also like has that a, a little bit, but not to the same degree. And I kind like I kind of want to like Alan Persinger's the best because it is so simple. But at the same time, though, repetition in such a short poem is so tricky. And we have in twice, and we have a a mm -hmm. melon in a field. We have that twice. Like and the A appears twice in the same line and the repetition almost feels like, and I'm, you know, probably to the spirit of the poem, like it's probably really right on. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there's something about that. I think that McFadden hits this, actually for me, hits the sweet spot of not being like devoted to 575 um, and also not being too repetitive. Like it's a little on the longer side. And I actually think that's, you know, I think that's okay. It's let's see. It's I think actually, actually it's like six five six, I think. Yeah. Um, and you know, like giving itself a little wiggle room allows it to, I think, be poetic, um, and like be get in the spirit of that without but it's also not repetitive. And so I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate that, but I the last line um is a little off for me. Find yourself a pillow. Yeah. Hidden among the leaves of the melon patch, I, th I think there's a there's a cut for me. The cut is missing. Yeah, it's true. I think it is too. Yeah. Um. Certainly, the in in Persingers, you have that element of like surprise. You know, like mm -hmm. finding a pillow hidden among the leaves, and you're like, "What pillow is this?" And it's like, "Oh, mm -hmm. it's a melon." <laughs> and then you think, "How yeah, can yeah. a melon like be comfortable enough to sleep on?" <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm thinking that all the way through in any of the translations. I'm thinking, oh, it's, "I don't." There is no pe like melon. It's I round. Know, it's yeah. like structurally unstable, but you know, it's a it's a poem, right? So <laughs> <laughs> let's go with it. Let's forgive them. But um, yeah. anyway, yeah, th no, that that was interesting. I hadn't picked up on the the constant repetitions of the A's. It's certainly in the Persinger one there. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that, Alison. Uh, before we move on to a different type of food, though, I have got another melon one for you. So the first one is translated by Yuki Sawa and Edith Markham Shifford. And it goes like this. By lightning, the small house was burned down and now melon flowers. By lightning, the small house was burned down and now melon flowers. And the second is another Persinger. After lightning, burn down the shack, melon flowers. After lightning, burn down the shack, melon flowers. I don't know if you have any thoughts on those two. Persons. I was like, oh man, I didn't know that. It, like, <laughs> that reminds me of one I wrote, which like sounds very <laughs> presumptuous. Um, but I have one um, about a giant prickly pear mm -hmm. that died and then sunflowers all came up in its oh. place um um and, and uh and i what i love like i just i love the poem mm -hmm. um i think they're both i this one i think like again and you know i'm speaking to my own bias here is that i have mm -hmm. uh a definitely like a um I, I'm partial to the more minimalism mm -hmm. of it. Um, you know, uh, after lightning burned down the shack, like it's direct. Um, yeah. The small house was burned down again. Like I just, um, passive construction has like some aesthetic purposes. I'm not going to, you know, be, I'm not, I'm never, I'm not going to say you should never use, you know, passive construction um, because it does have, you know, it has a time and a place. Um, but certainly for me, I'm, you know, if I'm an editor and you send me something with Pat, like that has a line in passive construction, you're going to have to work really hard. <laughs> I'll bear that in mind. Um, so, 
the this this one it comes from a book um haiku master buson which was first printed in 1978 the the sawa and uh, markham mm-hmm. shifford so i would say that was probably possibly reflecting what was going on and the in at the time and um the two of them i believe i wouldn't bet my life on it but i believe they were both in japan actually doing this so it could also it could reflect not just what was going on in the english haiku world but it could also reflect um what was going on in Mm. in the japanese haiku world but as i said i wouldn't bank my life on that one so there you go so we're going to stay in summer alison for the next busan poem and we're also going to take another look at what what busan might have been eating during those summer months but not fruit this time (laughs) <laughs> sharing are you trout yet not coming in he leaves the gate at midnight and that's another one by Ueda leaves some trout knocks goes on the evening gate Robert Hass bringing a trout my friend left immediately by midnight's gate Alan Persinger and lastly, leaving sweet fish, you don't come in, gate at midnight. And that's Fukusawa Noriko. Now, I didn't have a clue what this was, this fish was, but apparently it's a type of trout. Could be known as sweet fish. And pop, and it's fishing for it is very popular in Japan in summer. And according to our last translator, Fukusawa, who is a Busan expert, who is Japanese. This poem possibly alludes to an episode involving the fourth century poet, Chinese poet, Wang Ziyu. Because one night Wang, enticed by the beauty of the snowy moonlit lands- landscape, set out to visit his friend Dai and Deo. He travelled in a small boat, but upon reaching the gate of Dai's house at dawn, he returned home. When asked why, he's reported to have said that he visited out of the desire to do so and returned when that desire had gone. Busan would probably have known this, uh, but in Busan's case, he does leave, uh, his friend does leave a gift and lets him know that he's been there. So again, Busan is alluding to the ancients, but he's written his own thing in his own style. And Ueda says of this poem that the way it's put together it suggests the nature of friendship between two friends. I'm not entirely sure what he means because he doesn't say, but if it were me writing, I think I would be saying that they're good friends, the fisherman liking the other person well enough to give him a gift of the fish, but having the consideration not to disturb his friend and his family late at night. And I also like to think that Busson, on receiving this gift has offered a poem in return as a thank you. Now, how many of us send each other or our families little poems as thank yous or mementos sometimes I do but what about you Alison is that something you do mostly to my fellow poet friends uh, oh, okay <laughs> you know I, I'm not necessarily like I could probably actually like do this with with other people as well but I'm always like are other people gonna like get it <laughs> are, do, are people who not are who are not into poetry are they going to be actually interested in this I don't know um but I do it um like with well one I can't remember what the occasion was um I can't remember if it was Valentine's Day or he was coming back from one of his overseas trips but um th- when I made a bunch of tiny little broadsides of haiku I'd written on my various hiking and camping trips with John. And then I like put them all over his apartment for him to find one oh. by one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. That, that's <laughs> really nice. Uh, I, I'm sort of with you. I do send them, but um, I send them to my family because I'm I'm rather older than you, Alison. I sometimes think it would be nice if they, they had something from me personal to them when I'm not here anymore um but you're right I do sometimes wonder did they get it but I did go to my son's house and find one on the fridge that's sort of, oh you know, that's on sweet on a magnet in the fridge so I thought yeah okay it's worth doing so you know, yeah there's that but the other thing it reminded me of and I don't know um it was you that put this into my mind when we were sort of going back and forth about this podcast but 
you spoke about COVID and it made me think, well, when we have disasters in our personal lives, you know, when some one of our family is sick in hospital or somebody has died, often our friends and neighbours bring us gifts of food, don't they? And and leave them on our doorstep, but don't want to disturb us and go away again. And uh, it was something, you know, it reminded me then of that. And so thank you for sort of giving me another window on this this poem too. Was that what you were thinking? Yeah, I was, I was thinking, and it really to me, this like speaks to like, you know, we think what, it, what makes something timeless and you can't know if something is timeless or not until time happens. Um, mm -hmm. But I think this becomes a timeless poem because it is something that can like spark something in us in like very different circumstances. So I was thinking of how, um, you know, like people would, especially like people would get COVID and you, you couldn't go in, um, mm -hmm. but they needed something. So you would go and like, you would like mask up and put your gloves on and leave a bag of groceries on their door, but on their front step. And then mm -hmm. you would go away and then they would come out and get them. Yeah. Um, and it's, it was a way of like taking you, you, you had to take care of yourself and protect yourself, but you also had to help take care of other people. Yeah. Um, and I don't know something, you know, I certainly, I don't think that's what this poem is about, but it certainly like evoked that for me of like the, how do we like show, you know, love for each other in like these really crazy times that are in many ways, very scary. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Who knows what this, this whether this poem was talking about something like that. Um, but, you know, we write a poem and we send it out into the world. And you just don't know how it's going to connect with somebody. And if it connects with you like that, or it connects with me in a different way, I don't think it matters. Just the connection is important, really. To me, I don't know if you, if you're sort of more interested in people knowing exactly what you're trying to say and interpreting it in exactly this, the way you want them to i mean i think that's impossible um everyone <laughs> is going to, it is like everyone like everyone is going to come to a poem with their own life experiences and their own filters and their own opinions and so the poem is going to like it's going to become for them what it becomes um mm -hmm. and you know sometimes i'll i'll be like I don't know how you got there, but okay. And if it like, you know, and if it's relevant to you, then great. Um, you know, I, I always feel like my work is like about as pretty straightforward as it can be. Um, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes people just, you know, but they take it in their direction and like, you know, like if that's fine, you, you cannot, you can't control how someone else is going to interpret your work. So just who like don't you know I'm not going to stress about it and someone unless someone's like I don't know using it for nefarious purposes <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully that will never happen um okay so let's hear these poems once more um people should again think about the translations what you like about them what you don't like about them uh because as you've so rightly said earlier when we study these translations it helps us with our own work so Sharing are you trout, yet not coming in, he leaves the gate at midnight. Ueda. Leaves some trout, knocks, goes on, the evening gate. Robert Hass. Bringing a trout, my friend left immediately by midnight's gate. Persinger. Leaving sweetfish, you don't come in. Gate. At midnight, Fukusawa Noriko. I don't know about you, Alison, but that gate at midnight or the gate troubles me slightly. I me too. I, I really yeah. actually want I want the word the to be there. <laughs> I I do, and like I under I think I I understand that you know in in Japanese there aren't really articles, mm -hmm. you know, a and the where there there are not really in my understanding equivalents of that so i can see why someone wouldn't necessarily put them in but i'm like i really want i really want that <laughs> that article yeah. there <laughs> maybe that's it you're right it's, i just want the article it's it's missing for me yeah now i've got one last selection um something that you requested alison and i think you gave me the sam hamill translation 
uh, and then I went off and found some more. So I'm going to start with Sam Howell's translation. Autumn breezes spin small fish hung to dry from beach house eaves. Autumn wind and small fish have been strung up to dry from the eaves of a beach house. And that's another Yukisawa and Edith Markham Shifford. In autumn wind from the eaves of a beach house, dried fish hang. And that's another Persinger. So, Alison, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to turn this around to you and say, why did this poem make an impression on you? Why did you want me to feature this one? I mean, first of all, I love um, I, I I love that sort of image of um, these, like, I sort of just picture, I don't know, I picture my grandparents' cottage because I don't really have a, my grandparents had a cottage on Lake Erie. Um, oh. But, you know, I like, I've never really, like, lived near a beach, so I don't have a good sense of, you know, beach. But so I sort of, like, picture, like, dried fish hanging from, like, the screen porch of my grandparents' cottage, which is not a thing that ever happened. <laughs> That's just what my brain does. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's an interesting image of like these <clears throat> strung up fish, like swaying a little in the breeze, drying out in the sun. Um, and Sam, like, again, like I, I did this whole long blog about how I have a really like complicated like feelings about um, this collect this the sound of water, which is mm -hmm. this particular collection of Sam Hamill's translations. Um, and here, like one of the things that I notice about it is the way it employs it's 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 pretty subtle but there there is um uh some alliteration and some assonance in there breezes mm -hmm. spin small fish um beach house eaves mm -hmm. um there's a lot of that very poetic sound play in there um uh and i i am quite fond of this translation and yeah i in my blog, I wrote about a lot of other translations that I'm not so fond of. Um, it, it is. It's like it's it's <laughs> this doing this whole season has been like has been a reckoning of just like how did I feel about like stuff in my past and like writing that you know I encountered in the past and um, it, sort of actually de developing an appreciation for older translations that do sound a little clunkier because they are a product of their time um mm -hmm. and sort of you know you just I, you know i've sort of come to admit that like you cannot like something and you 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 can't this is, it goes back to the history like mm -hmm. um you know sam hamill like he did spend some time in japan mm -hmm. and he was trained by older poets you know yep. who and translators who learned about things a certain way mm -hmm. um and so it's it's you know, I don't necessarily like love all of the translations because they do in many ways, like feel a little old, a little mm -hmm. clunky. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I can't like change the fact that he like, came, like of the, you know, of the sort of poetic environment he came out of. Mm -hmm. um, but this one, I think he does some really good sound work in this mm -hmm. one. Um, that just, it doesn't show up in the same way as, as in some of the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I, I do like his sort of quasi adherence to 575, I think it frustrates, it frustrates me a little bit. <laughs> okay. Mm, okay. Well, he, and this one's see, not I... a strict, this one's not a strict 575. No, 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 no. Yeah. But... Um, and I, I did pick up a quote by him, Alison, and he said, sort of reflecting on what you, you've said, translation is a provisional conclusion. That's why the same classics need to be retranslated periodically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, sort of what you were building on what you were saying, he's gone back to a translation that would have been right for his time. And mm -hmm. he's learned from poets who are even older and will come to more recent ones, like the Persinger's more recent, for example. Yeah. He, uh, um, the Sawa and and uh, Markham Schiffer is probably older, which was very long and involved. The autumn wind and small fish have been strung up to dry from the eaves of a beach house. It's just there's a whole story in there. It's yeah, it's just too much for me. It is too much. It's absolutely too much. But um, so again, let me read them out, and people can 
go through them and pick out what they like and what they don't. Autumn breezes spin small fish hung to dry from beach house eaves. Sam Hamill. I think that's a lovely one to to read. It's just it, it's got some fluency on the tongue. It really rolls off. It does. Yeah. Autumn wind and small fish have been strung up to dry from the eaves of a beach house. Sawa and Markham Shifford. I think that's almost an opening. Um, it could almost be an opening sentence for something. Piece yeah. of prose. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you have Alan Persing, who's done it. He's gone freestyle. In autumn wind from the eaves of a beach house, dried fish hang. So there you go. Now, Alison, I hope you're going to allow, allow me one more poem. Oh, absolutely. It's, thank you very much. It's the final haiku that Busson created, dictated on his deathbed to his acolyte, Quito. And I've got, uh, again, I've got some translations for you. A couple of older ones and then a more recent one. With white plum blossom, these nights turn to the faint light of dawn. No, Alison, I've absolutely messed up that one. I'm going to read right. it to you again with apologies. All right. I can fix it too. <laughs> okay. With white plum blossom, these nights to the faint light of dawn are turning. Yukasawa and Edith Markham Shifford. Again, probably the opening to a, a whole bit of prose. With white plum blossom, these nights to the faint light of dawn are turning. Every night from now will dawn from the white plum tree. That's translated by Blythe from his haiku, volume two, spring. Every night from now will dawn from the white plum tree. And lastly, a more contemporary one by Dave Bonta. The night almost passed through the white plum blossoms, a glimpse of dawn. The night almost passed through the white plum blossoms, a glimpse of dawn. And when I read this poem, I was struck by two things. The first was the beauty of the white plum blossom set against my sadness, obviously, that it's Busson's last poem. And the second was a question, a bit of a morbid one. If I were to write a poem on my deathbed, what beauty would I see? What beauty would I write of? Would seasonality come into it? And in my case, and you may disagree, but I think um, we'll see, I believe that Kigo are essential in the creation of a haiku. I think my poem would perhaps speak of birdsong, a pesky wood pigeon that turfs up every spring and keeps me awake. Well, it's probably not the same one, but a wood pigeon turns up every spring and wakes me early in the morning. Or I'd be smelling honeysuckle, which grows on the trellis outside my my window. In autumn, perhaps I'd go for a taste of pumpkin soup, which is good, given what we're talking about today. Or then, because of where I live, the first snow in winter, it would have to be the snow plough. Beautiful to me, because it's getting rid of the snow, which those of you who listen to me wittering on about snow on my podcast will know, I absolutely detest snow. But Alison, I find it easy to define the season. I was brought up by farmers who had an acute feel for the seasons of the year, even when living in, in cities in London. So I, I don't worry too much about the exact time that the world dictates a season starts and finishes. I don't believe there is the seasons are as cut and dry as all that. You know, I've been picking and scoffing blackberries for a few weeks now, but in its summer. But I'll still be doing that for a few weeks to come um, in into the autumn. And I think blackberries are traditionally in autumn kigo um so what i'm really trying to say is that even if the start and finish of the seasons change as the climate changes you know climate climate is changing we will have seasons of a sort and we can include them in our work now if my summer includes melons but they come at a different part of the summer or they go into the they become part of autumn even i think you're still see them as a fruit of sunshine and still understand what I'm trying to say am I being a bit simplistic here Alison do you, do you get what I'm I don't think you are this is actually something I've been working toward um as part of this project um mm -hmm. um you know uh Chirone has an essay where he mentions that you know in the in the United States at least we don't have enough like 
cultural continuity the way that you know they do in Japan. Um, you know, we we you know, Hen you know, and Henderson has did Haiku World with his you know big international saijiki, um, and I think. I think Sato also has an essay. I could be remembering it wrong, but um, recently I read an essay. I think it was Sato about how, again, America, we just don't have like enough cultural cohesion and enough cultural mm -hmm. continuity. Um, and I think sort of, yes. And also we can develop that, you know, yes, you right. Haiku in English is at most about a hundred years old. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we're going with the imagists, it is at most a hundred years old, or, yeah. uh, or at least in the United States. Haiku in the United States is at best a hundred years old, if not less, depending on where you want to start it from. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that's not a long time. Like, look, no, no. <laughs> look, look how long that poets in Japan have had to develop um, mm -hmm. their cultural reference points. And I do think that what I'm, I've been working toward is is. And I'll probably sort of end this season with a whole episode about this is that food is one of the ways we can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, from, from like the, the wholesome melons and blackberries to, you know, the appearance of the pumpkin spice latte uh, that is, you know, the, but you know, we also, I, I also do think like, let's, you know, however we feel about, you know, capitalist chain food that's you know hyper processed well that's where we are now and mm -hmm. do we all know what it is is it a culture like love it or hate it it's a cultural reference point mm -hmm. um and i so i think there's you know we food is a way to again whether it's whether it's a whether it's a fancy coffee dessert or whether it's like the first fresh apple off the tree Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of room for cultural reference points there yeah I think you're yeah. right and yeah, I, th I think that is a starting ground for us to, like at least for people in the United States um or people in English speaking haiku to really start to develop some of those references that the, those you know common touch points that maybe yeah. we don't have right now but we could yeah yeah, I, I think so. I, I, but so do you think then that it, it's quite important in haiku to retain the idea of Kigo? I or think is that a whole that. different thing? <laughs> you know, I think it's, I think it's worth retaining. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I value, and look, I don't, I don't put a Kigo into every haiku. And that doesn't mean it's automatically a senryu or to me, I'm. Let me rephrase that. To me, I'm not overtly putting a kigo or a kigo in every time. Okay. Someone might see a kigo, <laughs> okay. right? Like someone might, like someone might say, "Oh, you know, you mentioned, I don't know." I'm, I'm looking like, um, if I write about something about the way the light in the morning is filtering through, like this, I'll, I'll show you when we're done recording this stained glass window that like this fake stained glass window that john is like that's actually a stained glass wall that john is putting into part of the house um if i write about how that light filters that to me is not necessarily seasonal but depending on how like i place that light during the day or the brightness of the light someone is going to say oh that's a that's summer because the light is bright very early or it's autumn because yeah. the light is very faint or something yeah um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think we should give up on Kigo. Um, I think how Kigo will ultimately function in English language haiku is not going to be the same, but syllables don't function the same. Uh, mm. the, the cut doesn't inherently function the exact same way because we don't oh, no. have the cutting word. So just because these things ultimately cannot slash do not function the same way does not mean we should get rid of them. It just means we have to figure out how do they work in a different language and a different cultural context. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again to Patricia for having such a great conversation with me, for taking time out of a Saturday evening to discuss Busan in such depth. I know that I got a lot out of it, many new um, avenues to consider. And uh, Patricia, I do hope that once I put out the uh, 
guidelines for season three, there's something you will want to contribute because I think you would do a great job. If you want to support the show, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash culinary sajiki. And if uh, financial support is not uh, your thing, share the show with someone who you think will appreciate it. You can get my uh, first all haiku chat book, Postcards from Texas, from Cuttlefish Books, or by contacting me directly. Information will be in the show notes. And, you know, it is not too late to join the conversation for season two. Go to culinarysaijiki.com, click the join the conversation link at the top, and let me know how you'd like to participate. Finally, please remember to get excited for season three. Start thinking about the various um, food-related traditions that are part of your life and your heritage and your community and uh, whether you'd like to uh, share them in a blog or a podcast just start brainstorming right now again details are going to come out pretty soon all right have a great rest of your week and thank you for listening